Okay. And I can now see the live chat. Everybody, I'm here with Dr. Grace Liu. She sometimes goes by the name The Gut Goddess. And what is your website, Dr. Liu? It's thegutinstitute.com. Thegutinstitute.com. It's the second time Grace has been on the show. Last time we had a really fun and lively conversation talking about all things gut microbiome. It might have been a bit rushed, and I might have jumped around to a thousand different topics because I could just talk about this stuff all day because it fascinates me. But today we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of these subjects, and we're going to talk to Dr. Grace Liu about the gut microbiome, how it is influenced by various factors in diet and lifestyle, how we can try and go about optimizing our situation, our health, our longevity, and our performance through optimizing our gut microbiome. And I want to start, to, I want to talk about, uh, about parasites and stuff like that because that's something that's really interesting. I've never really gotten into it before and it's something that I'm, I've been hesitant to talk about because it's just so freaky for some people and it kind of opens up a literal can of worms that uh, some people don't want to go down. Um, if you're squeamish, maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> buyer beware. <laughs> Uh, maybe tune out and listen to something else. But uh, we're going to talk about the gut microbiome and all the things that we all experience, but very few of us talk about. So, Dr. Liu, last time we talked about the gut microbiome and got through some of the uh, some of the basics. I want to just first of all start out by saying thank you um, for sending me some of your probiotics. Um, you sent me a bottle of this stuff called Bifido Maximus. And most probiotics you get, it's like little pills. You know, you get a pill, have two, 3,000 CFUs uh, per pill. Now, Dr. Liu sent us a bottle, and each scoop contains, what was it, 200 to 300 billion microbes? Yeah, one teaspoon is 250 billion, but a scoop is a little less. It's like 0 0.8 teaspoons, I think. Or, yeah. yeah. And you, you get 200 billion. And we try to make it really cost effective. We're not making the hugest margin on this at all, zero. But what I love is that it's sort of like uh, my gift to everyone's gut microbiome because these are very gentle. They, they can cause die off because they also can be powerful like breast milk. Um, as you know, breast milk has like these super amazing, you know, wonder powers. Uh, so many people even squirt it in their eyeball when they get like a eye infection, you know, red eye, pink eye. Um, but we emulate a lot of the strains um, found in breast milk. So we're replacing kind of what we've lost in the Western world. And we were able to deliver so much because we work with this um, amazing company, probiotic company, and we're going to make it even bigger and more en masse. Um, and what I love is that, you know, compared to a lot of other competitors, uh, we deliver so much, 200 billion per scoop. And it's actually super cost effective. If you're doing like a maintenance dose, only 12.5 to 25 billion um, uh, a day, you know, that's like a really good maintenance dose. People are spending, they only need to spend like about uh, $12 a month, really, yeah. literally, when you're on maintenance. No, totally. Yeah. And, the, and the stuff yeah. is really strong. I mean, I noticed yeah. the first time I took it, I felt some rumbling and stuff. And uh, I've, I've played with different dosages. I've done some, some quite large dosage. And uh, yeah, I mean, other probiotics that I've tried in the past, you mentioned that there's no, um, there's no, uh, what is it called? Uh, there's no, was it delactate strains in your, uh, these, uh, yeah, so they're sort of lactic acid free. I mean, not that these are bad, but for some people, they already have like overgrowth. That's a common overgrowth. I, I mean, I see it like in 50 50, like 50% of clients might come in with a higher lactic acid. Um, but um, these are what's special is they're strep free and histamine free. Strep is like one of the cheapest probiotics on earth. So it's literally like in everything, and it takes a big chunk of a lot of the bandwidth, you know, the, the amount of uh, billions of CFUs. In so it's a like a probiotic. filler. Almost like a filler. I think it's like a filler. Yeah, it goes in yogurt, it's used in food. Anything used in food production is usually ultra cheap. You know, and it's very transient, right? Like it doesn't really No, colonize. strep, the problem is like it may colonize. It's pretty parasitic actually. And um, the thing about strep is it's really adapted to the human system, all mammalian systems, because it lives in our on our skin and it can go anaerobic and live in the gut. It, like it can be in the cavities. like So it can go anaerobic like in abscesses in the mouth. And strep is just super nasty when it's one of the bad strains. So there's good strep and bad strep. Um, like strep mutans associated with cavities. That's not a, not, not a really good strep. And then there's other ones um, that I love to use. The other one, let me show you actually. She sent me Salivaris. A you um, sent me like a hundred gram um, bottle of this powder. Um, and it's just like plain probiotic powder. So you don't, you don't actually chew, like you actually take a scoop rather than uh, yeah. taking a pill. So you get to choose your dose on this, which I found uh, really yeah. cool. 
Yeah, but I don't use strep in the beginning of any treatment protocols, but later we use good versions that we know have like a lot of anti-inflammatory benefits and they belong in the human body, but many don't believe it belong in the gut. And do you remember um, Laura Ingalls and her sister uh, on Little House on the Prairie? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember the strep story in there? I, I actually don't remember that specific story. My wife probably does though. So her sister went blind after a fever when she was little and it was a strep reaction. So sometimes after certain infections like viral or strep, um, people develop an autoimmune problem afterwards. The body's just trying to finally, you know, do the final clearing and get rid of the uh, pathogen. And in a lot of cases, you know, it'll be strep, um, strep pneumonia or other kinds of strep, all the strep like ag agalateris. I mean, they have like horrible names <laughs> and they're m like nearly all the strep are uh, human pathogens like and cause mm -hmm. horrible bloodborne problems. And then the, when the body makes antibodies, then it starts attacking it. So if we even introduce a so-called good strep probiotic, the body is already on high alert and attack. So just because of the similarity, then there's this audit, there can be this immune challenge going on in the gut and then it, it impacts people. They, they can develop new problems. And that's what mm -hmm. we've seen for people who come to us who are on various you know, wacko strains of like high, high dose strep or even yeah. lower dose strep. So we, we try to minimize that. So just in the beginning stage, stages, this probiotic just get, is really foundational. So I'm glad you liked it. Did you notice yeah, cool. big changes? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the first couple nights, it changed the timing of my movements and my bowels, which I always find as an indicator oh, of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to me, That's it's like. Litmus. Yeah, I, I don't know. The, the timing of it, it confuses me sometimes too, though, right? Because sometimes the timing will shift and, and it, could be, it could be hard to correlate, right? To correlate yeah. what exactly is tipping the system in what direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but I definitely noticed that it changed the timing of my movements and it definitely, uh, it definitely helped to smooth things out a little bit for, uh, for like a few days. And after that, it wasn't any like noticeable overt um, effects, but I've, you know, I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff all the time, right? Like I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've been using a lot of methylene blue lately. That's something I wanted to talk to you about actually in the last, podcast this if, if i wanted to ask you if it's something you've explored at all is uh I've, first of all have you heard of methylene blue the dye i had done some research on that like many years ago and i can't remember uh well, they, they've used it for, into that. yeah they, uh, so they used it for malaria um for a long time it's a dye it's been around since the 1800s and it's actually a mitochondrial enhancer so what methylene blue supposedly does, and when, is it, when your mitochondria are exposed to red light, there's a synergistic mm -hmm. effect that methylene blue seems to have in mm -hmm. helping the mitochondria produce energy. But mm -hmm. there were some studies done on methylene blue for treatment of parasites, especially malaria. And mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, yeah, I've been I've been taking methylene blue, for, and I'm not recommending that other people do it. It's like not for human consumption. This is something I'm experimenting with. But mm -hmm. uh, I found it really fascinating that I actually. And uh, this might sound really gross to a lot of people, but the second night after I took methylene blue, I had some rumbling. And it was actually, I think it was like three days. And this is ago. with the probiotic or without the probiotic? This is before. I'm wondering. Okay, this all right. right. Separate, before, separate before it's a probiotic, actually. Okay. But I ended up passing a parasite after taking methylene blue and doing an intense sauna with niacin. Now, I don't know what, you know, it's like you do th several things at once and who knows right, what it was, right, but something right. came out of me and that something was a little worm. <laughs> and I, you know, I've, I've passed parasites in the past. It's not like, you know, some people might be there. Oh, it's, maybe it's because you live in Ecuador, right? You live in Ecuador, you know, you live in a, uh, so a third world country. And that's why the first parasite I ever passed was 2009. Uh, okay. when I was in California, my, you know, I'd lived in California my whole life. Yeah, exactly. So, um, at the time I was in California in 2009. So, but anyways, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you if you've heard of methylene blue, if you've ever used it in these novel ways and there's not much research on it, but, um, yeah, just, just throwing that one out there. But anyways, yeah, I took your pro bag. I thought it was really amazing. You well, you know what, what, what is really synonymous with, um, mitochondria? The microbiome? Yeah, like the bacteria. right. Yeah. Mitochondria yeah. are actually bacteria. Yeah, like mitochondria were at one time rickettsia and um, so small. And then <clears throat> it's theorized they were endocytose by larger cells, larger bacteria. Now, what I'd be interested in is seeing like how mitochondria actually might be communicating with bacterial colonies in the body um, through perhaps magnetic field fluctuation we know that mitochondria react to light magnetic field flux absolutely yeah there's all kinds of signaling yeah yeah and when you look yeah. at bacteria and how they reproduce they're definitely influenced by magnetic field they're definitely absolutely. especially electromagnetic fields which uh 
you know, um, I think I've seen some studies about non-native electromagnetic fields making human beings more susceptible to candida. So, I mean, this was, and I'm not sure if this has been fleshed out more, but, uh, and it could be an, an erroneous claim, but yeah, I mean, these, these subtle fluctuations in light and the environment and mm -hmm. heat and cold. They're un unnatural for us too. Yeah. They're all human made, right? Yeah. So, all right. So let's talk about some of the factors that affect our gut microbiome and the balance of our microbiome. And I want to kind of tie in the parasite relationship, the Helminth relationship with bacterial colonies, because this is something that I'd like to explore in my own research. Uh, and it's, uh, we're probably limited in how much scientific uh, knowledge there is out there yeah, on this one. Yeah, I don't know how much of the data um, yeah. scientifically there so is. So what are some of the factors that affect uh, uh, the microbiome? Other than just, you know, obviously the composition of the diet, but what are some other things that might affect our gut microbiome that are non-diet related? I hope this is not too crazy of a question for you. Um, well, some of the studies are showing um, there's a relationship um, even with our hormones, like the estrobilome, uh, estrobilome, estrogens, and I, um, I, they all they see is correlations, right? Like, so if we have an estrogen state or PCOS state, like we have a class coming up um, right uh, in a month or two, um, acne, aches, and anxiety. It's it's kind of targeted for like our PCOS, you know, our Western woman who has horrible PMS, clots in her menstrual cycle every month, you know, and kind of, you know, anxious, wacko, like uh, for one day, you know, of the month. But anyway, um, well, how about the, you know, the average American man who's an anxious and then, yeah, the men every is the day opposite. of his yeah. life? <laughs> men are estrogen dominant. They've lost their testosterone. You know, their masculinity is unaligned with the current, <clears throat> you know, thing. and they're, you know, always in defense, you know, and, and they, don't, they don't have confidence because T, testosterone is our hormone for affiliation, actually. It's an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And it, um, <clears throat> you know, it also works in conjunction with oxytocin. Oxytocin is our hormone for trust, and even our um, even our microbiome um, knows that because there's really amazing studies that show lact lactobacilli strains and probably many other strains too that are considered symbionts in the gut. They're highly associated with increasing oxytocin, and oxytocin is associated with wound healing. Yeah, so there's like many many things, and so if you're trusting, you're not in fear. So then you also don't have <clears throat> the growth factors that turn on pathogens and parasites. There's less <clears throat> cortisol and adrenaline. Like our parasites and helminths and uh, E. coli pathogens, other bacterial pathogens, they have pathogenicity islands on their DNA. They recognize when adrenaline's high. They love it when adrenaline's high. And so when, you know, normally for ancestral man and woman, you know, they weren't stressed. Even if it- you get some shots of adrenaline. Yeah, but the, the, yeah. Uh, so even the microbes, them. yeah, were co-evolved with them. You mm. know, they were always looking for that opportunity, but our ancestors probably were not stressed much at all, you know, only during like really few seconds of like, you know, probably every couple months, it's, you know, there's some estimates like they're not going to be, you know, we had such different kind of defense systems and right. It's like we, <clears throat> yeah, more modern man, it's like we've got our cell phone connected to our face. Like we're basically living there's in our cell phone, signal. walking around staring yeah. at it. And every time it beeps, we get the fight or flight response. Um, I mean, people don't, yeah, people don't nap. I mean, just the deficiency of mm -hmm. certain things. There's no, oh, people no don't napping. talk to people too. They don't I mean, even talk. talk. Yeah. Everybody's on Facebook arguing about nonsense that they're fed by the news media. Like they're, they're giving yeah. talking points to argue about top down news media talking points and everybody's bickering over the, the fake things that they're given to fight over rather than actually connecting with neighbors, connecting with their families, which right. most families are, you know, the, the family has kind of been broken up for the most part, right? right? Like there, is pseudo, there is pseudo oxytocin. So really amazing couple studies, you know, people who do see their friends' faces on Facebook or some other media, they get a little hit of oxytocin, but it's There's only 10% real. of, of real, real interaction. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. And it has to be someone they know. Right. Yeah. Grace, did you see yesterday? Sean Parker actually came out and said that he were, he's uh, conscientious of you know Sean Parker. Um, he was the creator of Napster. Sean Parker um, helped to get okay. Peter Thiel and the angel investors. The initial angel investment in Facebook uh, was brokered through Sean Parker's connections. Um, I see. So he's a really interesting character, just in like you know the history of the internet. Um, right. Yeah, very influential guy. Sean Parker came out and he said straight up, like I, you know, Facebook was designed 
Two, get you to waste as much time as possible as you can, and it's designed to manipulate human psychology, human emotions, to give you little tiny trickles of dopamine and oxytocin, to actually make you addicted to the platform so that we can advertise you and essentially control your behavior via this platform. You straight up came out and said this. Oh, on, wow. Um, Thanks. I forget what, it was an interview yeah. or an article, but it's a real right. quote. Like, it's not just some made-up I bet. Quote. I'll have to go find that. Facebook. I'll, I'll yeah. Google dopamine and, and Napster and oxytocin. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. right? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, they're disruptors because they understand the neuropsychology of humans. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, do, so do our flora. So let's go back to the floor. <laughs> they understand it too. So when we eat sugar, and I used to have a, a parasite called Morganella, um, Morganella, and I had two actually, Morganella, which is a bacterial parasite, and then um, and Limex uh, Nana, which a lot of people have. I think even Cresser had that one. I, I forgot, like so many people have it, it's no big deal. But I'd eat sugar and that would turn them on because they uh, love simple fuel like sugar and carbs. You know, after we break down even complex carbs, if I broke down like steel cut oats or quinoa, you know, I'll still get carbs and sugar. Yeah. That's the whole point, right? Um, and then we get a surge of serotonin. Morganelle is a huge factory for serotonin, actually. So there's this little high, right? Oh, I'm happy. I eat sugar, happy, right? And then mm -hmm. it plummets. And then they, and as it plummets, Morganella colonies in our body probably plummet as well because they need constant fuel. They're, you know, so most they die. Are pretty they die. They so die. as they die off, you know, there's more triggers because we they built this serotonin um, flushing of the system. You know, so as as our serotonin drops, we're gonna crave what makes them happy, which is more carbs and sugar. So this yeah. is where a lot of sugar cravings come from. And then because in the modern world we have all this like ways to hit dopamine, you know, plug in working out or working, you know, some people yeah. are addicted to working or plug in porn or plug in um, video games or plug in yeah. whatever you want, right? Exactly, like, Facebook yeah. or just look at your phone real quick. Just have your hijacked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like Napster who hijacked our brain and Facebook hijacked our brain, but the flora have too, they, they know when they can hit dopamine. A lot of, a lot of the parasites also are big factories of dopamine. Like how are they making all these amines? And they, they have, they're making all these polyamines, not just histamine, but dopamine and um, many like different kinds that are derivatives of all the, our neurotransmitters. That's incredible. So we're literally looking at factories of neurotrans or neurotransmitter factories living in our body. Um, now, what are some other things? But that there's the good flora too. So, like our bifidomax, right. exactly. Well, you factor serotonin. for GABA. Some a serotonin. GABA. Yeah. yeah. They, they, some make it. Uh, log, bif, bifalong is associated with um, ga, ga, uh, with serotonin. We we also have several strains that are associated with GABA. GABA is the chillaxer. Like, if you could put chillaxing in a probiotic, the, these are the strains. Like a lot of people tell us, yeah, I feel so happy and calm. Like first time in my life, I'm like, yeah, I know, yeah because you had all these parasites. And our probiotic does two things, right? It helps move some of the parasites out, right? There's a die-off killing effect and reestablishment of the good stuff. And then they actually are sort of like, you don't want too much, you know, obviously, but there, there are many factories of good stuff for us yeah. that, that are meant to be. Maybe maybe this is what ancestral uh, homo sapien had. They were all happy in their little caveman homes and, you know, living by the firelight and, for you know, foraging and playing together, fro frolicking and making all these like really great flora and gut, you know, gut. That movies. is such a Disney movie version of it. Come on, Grace. I know, I know, I know. Come and on, they got then, wounds. They, they, the they, had comes. Tigers. they had neighboring tribes that were cannibals. <laughs> but they were so far apart, fifty miles apart. They'd have to right. Well, it would depend on the to, on the, to go the fight actual each other. geography, right? Yeah. Like here, when you look at the history, now we're just too close together. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, you you get um. Yeah, the, the population issues is, is pretty. So that's that's why like high density is probably not super ancestral yet. We all live mm -hmm. super like non ancestral, really close to each other. So the, the parasites, mm -hmm. this is why modern plumbing, I'm a big fan of it because otherwise we'd all have dysentery and be, you know, pooping liquid all day long, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, having sanitation miraculously changed Rome and it became like the hub of civilization, music, yeah. culture, writing. If we didn't have that, where would we be, right? So. Yeah. Parasites, they like to jump hosts. That's evolution. And we're the best hosts. You know, we move around, we're smart, we touch each other, we, you know, feed and we have babies and we have dogs and animals live all around us. So I was showing you my dog because, you know, dogs lick and eat everything, including yeah. even other dogs' poo, like the really not so bright ones. <laughs> but that's their way of re inoculating their probiotics. Yeah. It's in the poo, right? And I think ancestrally, we probably did too. Like there wasn't toilet paper, right? Mm hmm. And if we right. look at ancestral healthy um, hunter-gatherers, 
anywhere, like in Bolivia, South America, or Africa, Maasai, they all have parasites and they're perfectly healthy and fine. But they right, also have plenty of the good and stuff. They have plenty of the strains that are in our bifida maximus. Mm -hmm. They have plenty of the ABC. They have plenty of acromantia typically. Um, all animals on earth have acromantia, even bees and boa constrictors and bats and fish, they all have acromantia. So there's certain strains that are just inherent to life on earth, you know, but they have also bifido, all the, you know, hunter-gatherers have bifido. And they have certain strains known as, I call the C's, you know, like Christian Sinella, they keep us lean and thin. Mm -hmm. um, probably, it's probably super antiparasitic, I believe. All, all the really healthy good ones are usually have, they call it um, uh, control, like pathogen control. Yeah, because they want themselves to reign and rule. You know, the little right. gut empire. So, like, uh, so let's let's give. I'll give you a couple of examples of some strains. So, what about um, Bacillus? Not coagulans, but that's what. Well, there's an interesting I one. Bacillus, those, coag I Bacillus coagulans. Yes, and, and a couple of really good uh, probiotics. And that's a dopamine producing one, isn't it? Doesn't it actually produce? Uh, I don't. Yeah. I'm, I'm. I haven't drilled. I don't remember. It probably is. I, I, okay. A lot of them are. Yeah, yeah. So that was and a dopamine from, and they're one. Bacilli, and, so they live in, um, you know, they they often are spore based, and they're just all over our dirt. They're coating well, our kids and our and our fungal pets. Fungal microbiome. So the okay. the fungal microbiome of the body. A lot of people get really freaked out about candida. We talked a little bit about candida before. Uh -huh. I, I think candida is. I think it's a big issue. I think a lot of people get myopic about a lot of different issues and candida can be one of those, right? Like everything is candida. If you talk to some of the people who are in a candida, um, but it's how like much SIBO. Of the gut everyone talks about SIBO. Oh, it's all bacterial. Well, actually you're missing like millions of other strains of stuff that are in the gut. So it's this, I think the same thing with candida, people get myopic because we know how to culture mm -hmm. candida. So it shows up if it's going to show up, but there's actually rhodotorula. There's like, usually five or six strains of candida, but we're not massaging that data out, you know, yet there's usually huge diversity of fungal overgrowth, just like we see huge diversity of pathogens. You know, usually we don't get one E. coli. If you really drill it out, there's like five or 10 strains of E. coli. And yeah. then, yeah. And, and then when we have healthy people, we have five or 10 strains of bifido, but you know, in ours, we have a seven strain lacto and bifido, you know, and, and, and uh, bifido, you know, we're, it'd be ideal to get even more in there, but um, normally a healthy gut would have five or 10 strains of lacto, five or 10 strains of bifido, but we don't see that all. I'm, I'm lucky if I catch anybody who has even one bifido strain and a lacto strain that's, you know, actually not in a, you know, not in a, in a yogurt. So then most people, these good strains that we want to have that are going to be producing beneficial neurotransmitters and create a nice homeostasis in the body and in the gut. Exactly. And inflammation levels, a lot of these are missing and in their place. Extinct. Are, they're extinct. <laughs> extinct. They're going extinct. And then in their place, these other things seem to be thriving. I mean, we've got candida albicans, um, the other interesting pathogenic ones like toxoplasma. I mean, that's a really fascinating one. And I think it it's, is. I think it's underrated and understudied. And when you actually look at the associations between toxoplasma gondii, uh, which is, this is a fascinating one. Right? So it do, is. do you want to tell them where it comes from, where toxoplasma comes from? <laughs> Cat poo, any poo, any pet poo. Cat poo, human so the poo. Cat, so the, but what does it do to rats? Crazy people poo. Anyone crazy usually has antibodies for right? talk, so yeah. Right. You live in Berkeley, California. You got lots of, you got lots of oh, cats. Oh, lots, there. yeah. We have the ladies with like the little apartment and they got like 50 cats. Yeah, or the or the little old men talking to themselves, yeah. No, right. With auditory, <laughs> auditory and visual hallucinations, yeah. I used to work in a closed world clinic um, when I was, when I got trained at the VA. A lot of people look super normal, um, and then what studies show for anti-psych um, people on anti-psych meds, they actually have very high antibodies against um, toxo, and probably and, and and there are actually other parasites also implicated as well in antibodies against them. So absolutely, probably, probably they might stuff be, not measuring too. Yeah, it's believe it might even be autoimmune a little bit, not for everybody necessarily, right? But many of the cases it might be autoimmune because studies show the anti-psych drugs they have guess what? They're antibiotics against toxo. And as the antibodies go down, their symptoms go down. Uh huh. Yeah. And we're also looking at increased suicide uh, in humans with toxoplasma and uh, increased risk behavior, including desire for unconventional sex practices like anal sex, which I'm, I'm you know, excuse the. Uh, that's but, that's I mean, the is, parasite I mean, hijacking the host for sure. Right. I mean, this is like literally opening up the microbiome, creating micro lesions in there. I mean, these are practices that. 
Uh, and uh, it's a it's a fascinating thing when you Which look not at bad. It's just I think if the whole tribe was healthy, like go at it, right? But if it's not so healthy, then there's a lot of convergence. Of, I don't like, see how it can be healthy creating micro trauma in the anus. But I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I'm not into the whole PC thing. I can't be convinced of that at this moment. But maybe someone could. Uh, so anyway, so um, you know that's where poop comes out. I don't. I, one way. <laughs> one way street in this. But if you had perfect poo, it may not be such a big thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, it's fast. <laughs> You're like no. <laughs> no one's going back there. <laughs> that are actually influencing the behavior of the host in profound ways. And when you look at most how, people are not healthy. Like they. Yeah. I. I like they. Need, so, like, we're, we're, so we got we got cats rehab. spreading these parasites to humans, which then changes human behavior, and it, it changes cats' that, behavior too, right? They're it less, changes they, rats' behavior to make rats not afraid of predators. Yes, they lose the fear factor, so they're yeah. super promiscuous, super running around, no fear. Well, you know what Toxto does also in humans? It increases GABA. How weird is that? Yeah, so, so they chills lose you their, out while it positive. dumbs you down. Exactly. Yep, really dumbing down, right? So it's a really interesting thing when we look at things like GABA, when you look at things like dopamine, it's like, hey, dopamine's I great. Know. Well, dopamine feels really good. Therefore, you think we're all chemical all soups? We need to hit our Justin? dopamine receptors really intensely, so let's all get some heroin because dopamine. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like it's, we, we got to keep balance. And then we'll share a new needle so we can get the crack in there and share all our microbes. <laughs> we'll sh share the needle with your we'll Share the needle. Yeah. Dopamine, too. So yeah, there's exactly. the proxy right there. Make, so, your, make your dog thing. lick it and sterilize it, right? I got somebody right here. He's saying his biggest fear in the world is parasites. And I think that this is a fascinating thing. This really hits on something that's fundamental in human consciousness and in our psyche is the, it's almost like we've, uh, we have this kind of ancestral knowledge of the presence of these pathogens and how they do influence behavior. Um, and when you look at a lot of the, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of cultural traditions around the world, a lot of them are built around maintaining certain practices that will affect the gut microbiome, right? Like even, yeah. I don't know, like the Jewish it, tradition but... and stuff like that. Like uh, Muslims, they don't want them to eat right. pork, you know, trichinosis. So you have all these practices culturally to maintain certain gut microbiota uh, balances or imbalances and stuff. I believe and, so, um, right. This, this stuff it just fascinates me, like at the macro level, how we could be literally looking at entire societies that could be influenced by ebbs and flows of bacterial colonies that flow through human organisms and meta-organisms like societies. Um, right. You know, I mean, it's so just really, absolutely... Who, really, who's part of the macrocosm? Who's controlling who, huh? <laughs> well, that, when you, that's what it kind of comes down to. Are it we just chemical comes... soups and they're controlling our chemical soup? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, there, you get to the paradox of it, of life whenever, anytime you look deeply enough in anything, it kind of seems to result in a paradoxical. Have you heard of pre prions? You yes. live outside of U.S., yeah. So, like, yeah, anyone who's been in the U.K., they can't even donate blood in the U.S. because of the risk of prions and mad cow. This is crazy. All right. So, parasitic relationships, all right, parasite host relationships can influence Gut microbiome. I pulled up this study earlier. I don't have it. It's on my, my PC. I'm on the laptop. The study said that roundworms can actually create a beneficial gut bacterial environment. Um, are, you, are you kind of familiar with any of this research on um, how the relationship between gut microbiome and between bacteria and helminths mm -hmm. might affect a host and the health of the individual? Yeah, there's a really wonderful book you should read. It's, called, uh, it's, uh, it's by Moises Velasquez. Okay. Uh, and um, actually, he's out in the Bay Area here now. We interviewed him for a podcast, and I think he himself has tried helmet therapy, and he's really brought a shell of light on it. Uh, any, any any therapy that shifts immunity, like I'm into like other things, like fermented uh, white mistletoe from Germany. Yes. It's a, it's a brew, yeah, and it's all based on anthroposophical medicine, you know, Rudolf Steiner and you know, old style ancestral farmers. I think you really like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the energy fields of earth actually the magnetic fields and how to harvest and when to harvest and you know mm -hmm. when there's storms and there's a lot of magnetic chaos whatever you know you don't you don't create the medicines at that time mm -hmm. and um anyway moises talked about how helmets can be used in certain therapies and it shifts immunity so if we shift immunity successfully we can get rid of all kinds of things he was trying to improve his autoimmunity for <clears throat> alopecia areata where he lost a lot of hair and, it, and if it works correctly, it can shift things. It can improve autism. You know, it can improve any kind of autoimmune disease. Maybe it can even improve cancer. On the flip side, it's just like a it's like it's like a vitamin. Anything that's a vitamin is also a pro-oxidant in, in a given state. 
if it can take an electron, it can, you, you can bet you it can download the fuck out of an electron. So anything antioxidant also is, has the huge potential to be pro-oxidant. Just like we have nuclear, right? Mm. We get so much energy from fission, but you know, we get, you know, on the flip side, it's hugely like toxic also. Yeah. <laughs> like huge energy, but then huge, you know, there's another side. It's Everything's like, like that. The mitochondria need to generate reactive oxygen species. Yeah. Like we need to create things but when it's on the fritz, it's like a nuclear power plant melting down. You know, mitochondrial disease is just like our gut microbiome disease. I, I think it's huge corollaries. Yeah. There's one micro and then the other is just super macro. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think, yeah, helmets probably have a, you know, some people may be doing really hot and well because they've got something in them that's shifted, you know. The, right. And that's what always confuses me the, sometimes about this stuff because it's like, all right, so you test, you test, right, and you find something. Now, in the modern paradigm, it's like, it's a binary system. It's you find something and that something is good or bad. And it's like kind of, well, okay, so you, you go, you get a gut, like here in Ecuador, right? So you get a stool test and they'll tell you positive or negative for bifido. They'll tell you um, positive or negative for ongos, which, you know, for, um, for fungal uh, growth. Okay. And that's all they tell you. Oh, and okay. You can, you can culture stuff and you can figure out what parasite you might have, but... I don't know, it's just the, the testing for parasites and the actual, this whole thing has always interested me. Now, if you go, if you look at some of like the vegan stuff, right? According to the vegans, everyone's got parasites. The parasites are creating every single, and not all the vegans, but like there's a certain strain of the vegans that I'm sure you've uh, you've seen where it's like- I haven't heard that, all, that's interesting, okay. There's, yeah, there's a lot of, like a lot of them get really into the the parasite thing, you know? It's like a mm -hmm. lot of the, uh, the turpentine people, you know? Like they're really, really, into like the parasites are what are creating all this and it's the meat and it's the, the oh, well, right. That's, that's the conclusion I was getting. I at see. Oh, so, okay. Huh. So a lot of people they'll come, they're like, all right, I got these parasites or like they may have passed a parasite. They freak out and they start looking online. Google doctor sends them to some, you know, the top vegan, whoever it is. Like, I don't know who it is. I see. There. Huh. Uh, and then they get a little bit freaked out and, um, and they think the meat's doing it. They think that like the eggs are creating it. So where are these parasites coming from? Is this like a, is it as simple as don't eat meat, don't eat eggs, you won't get parasites? Or is there something a little bit more subtle going on? Um, I, I believe parasites have been as long on earth as all animals and um, living living beings. Um, there's always something that's opportunistic. So they're in the environment. Yeah, even so it's like getting rid even of even all of them. Vegan deer, even happening. vegan deers, they carry Giardia, right? Where, where, do you, where do you think we get Giardia? Yeah, and and Giardia affects a lot of people in the Western world as well. It's not just throwing. Oh people. yeah, yeah. But th there are some studies that show certain genetic SNPs don't get as much of it. Like I don't have that. I don't have the protective SNPs at all. And then the people who tend to get the autoimmune gut problems, they, they have the worst SNPs. They, they have mutations that don't seem to do facial recognition for fungal overgrowth. So fungal overgrowth just end up all over. Like there's Dectin-1 mutations. They don't, you know, yeast don't, aren't, you know, recognized so they can't be eliminated so well. Because they're, they're constant opportunistics on uh, humans. So we always have systems built in. But those that are mutated, they don't. And I believe they probably lived in a system where these mutations appeared, but made no difference on the population because they were really healthy. You know, they ate great prebiotics in their diet, great probiotics in their diet, and they probably had, you know, just a, an amazing ecosystem. So these mutations appeared and it was like no big deal, didn't affect anyone's mortality. But now in the Western world, we have so many ways we're killing off those guardians, those really good flora in the gut that keep that homeostasis, you know, and then it becomes a big deal. And these are the people with inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. Invariably, they've got five different kind of detectable fungal overgrowths. So really they've got 50, you know, we, we can only detect a couple, a handful. Yeah. And for them, like when they do uh, fungal, you know, uh, regimens, you know, so much fungus comes off, they bleed, you know, they leave little pockets and they end up bleeding, which is inherent to the condition anyway. There's always mucus and blood and mucus and blood. Um, but, um, they, they get overgrown a lot easier. So in terms of their Petri dish, it's like more overgrown for that. Yeah. So actually, so, all right. So for people who do have these fungal overgrowth issues, right? So I know, all right. So me, myself, when I first started getting into health, 
Candido was one of like the first things that started coming up for me in my life because I was getting oh, right, like, right. you know, at the time. You had like, a car was, accident as well, Tristan? I yeah, I had a car yeah. accident. So yeah. that's a huge, like, sometimes that involves like brain, you know, yeah. CTBI kind of well, thing. Spinal neck, calls, so any, any kind of, yeah, any nervous system, that's a hit. And anything that hits our nervous system, I would say instantly breaks the gut. Instantly there's high permeability, instantly, sometimes even ischemic events. I mean, endurance athletes do this and we have plenty of studies that show that that happens to them. You know, as soon as blood is diverted out of the gut, the, the huge GI tract, and it goes somewhere else to repair or, you know, take care of life <laughs> and keep living, uh, you know, then the gut will suffer. Something has to suffer, something gives, right? But really, yeah. you know, elite, healthy people with certain genetic SIPs, they get away with a lot more. But at some point now in the Western world, like people just get epically multi levels of getting ill. So what, what I had, when I when I was forced to actually start to deal with it, right? What happened to me was, I mean, I grew up shitty diet, uh, asthma, allergies, antibiotics, you know, the pink medicine, amoxicillin, all that lovely stuff. Uh, lots of uh, lots of the uh, the steroids for uh, asthma, you know, lots of. Yeah, uh, I had a lot. I had the same pathway too. That yeah. bottle of amoxicillin was basically a bottle of asthma. It's delicious. It's delicious it's, stuff. It's, it's, tastes yeah, like bubble it's, gum in a. It yeah, it's like they they make it taste so good. It's it's so annoying. I, know, I used to want extra. I used to, I used to, I remember so one you had time, sugar like, cravings. You had a lot of sugar cravings. Oh, totally. So that was my yeah. thing, right? It was like, yeah. I'd wake up, I'd eat that's, sugar, sugar, what, sugar. And I was okay, point. kind of, right? Like I had yeah, depression right. during high school that I dealt with and right. like some social anxiety stuff coupled with depression and it was use, usual teenager stuff. I didn't associate it with that at all at the time. No. Then college came around. I kind of like had like a major awakening in a lot of ways and kind of got beyond a lot of things. And it, everything was awesome. My body maybe wasn't functioning perfectly, but like, hey, at the time it was like, go, go, go. Like, let's live. Then I got this major injury and ended up kind of semi hurt for a while. And my recovery was beer, weed, and you know, like Ben and Jerry's. Like that was that was what All I did. All the great things for the gut microbiome. Literally, so it's like you get this injury and it's creating a chronic inflammatory response in the body. And the pain didn't even start till like months later because mm -hmm. it was all locked up in the fascia mm -hmm. tissue and it was just my oh. hip got locked up. I was like, oh, cool, I'm fine. Like, I'm totally okay, I'm gonna be all right. And uh, then it started creeping up and oh. I realized what I had done. But uh, yeah, that was my recovery and I went through a period of, uh, of a lot of pain and during that pain period, I treated myself horribly. So then after that, you're just trying to recover. Like, you're trying to feel better. Yeah. yeah just body, to feel our bodies better. have amazing wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> so then after that, like fungal overgrowth, stuff like that started popping up, like, hmm. you know, yeast infections, just crap that I'd never dealt with in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you I think want to go over the signs of what yeast infections are. Yeah, we have a exactly newsletter, coming out. Yeah, we have a newsletter coming out on Sunday. There's some really we talked about signs. we talked about bleeding and, from the butt, but what are some of the more subtle signs of fungal overgrowth and yeast infections? Um, so we, I can go tongue to tail. So like white yeah. tongue or like Asian medicine looks at tongue. So any kind of, I, I think any color of the tongue indicates to me fungal overgrowth. That's like the major foundational dysbiosis that people have. So it could be white tongue, but it could be yellow or reddish or any of them. The, the other colors kind of mean other things are layered on more parasites, more bacterial things. And that's people that like a black things. tongue. You ever see black? Ooh, no, that doesn't sound very good. Sounds yeah. Gnarly, right? right. But like, so dandruff. Mm -hmm. I have that. Uh, allergic shiners, like a lot of people who are pale may have that. You can tell very clearly, yeah. right? Any kind of eczema or psoriasis. So eczema psoriasis can hit sensitive areas like elbows, creases, um, behind the ears, on the ears, you know, any, yeah. anywhere. Yeah, acne. Yeah, between the toes. That's a huge get... fungal overgrowth, yeah. You acne. know what happened when I was a kid? Foot fungal, like not, it yeah, was so we're going to, Yeah, we're going tongue to tail. Yeah, then we go down. <laughs> Then you can have eczema, psoriasis, plaques, or, you know, or acne. A lot of people have butt acne, mm -hmm. acne, <laughs> or back acne. Yes. Yeah, and it, and yeah, I used to have that too. It, like creeped up the butt, and then all around the back, and then down. Like I, I, I got rid of it multiple ways, but it always made some like circle around migration on <laughs> the human body. Yeah. You know, just like you know, people get shingles. There's a dermatome. It'll hit certain things. Our gut has sort of a path to the dermatomes. It's through the lymph actually, or or there probably are other pathways as well. All right, and then we go lower. So like women, we can have multiple layers of fat and then we get, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of yeasty uh, or staffy, you know, overgrowth where it's red or, you know, it's like, a, it's like a diaper rash, but, you know, in between the breasts, you know, and the men have something similar, right? Jock itch, anything moist, you know, moisture captures, you know, there can be locked in, you know, uh, a, a skin terrain that's not exactly optimal, optimal, right?
For sure. Yeah, that started happening in college. I started getting jock itch in college. And then some people have acne, right? Yeah, in the jock itch area. That's the worst. And then you go down. That was so gross because you're just like, oh, because it feels like it feels so unclean. You're like, no, no, it's all changeable. And then it's always like um, the worst of the worst if there's less circulation, peripheral vascular disease, Raynaud's, any of those, there's hand, there's fingernail fungus. But most people, it's the toe fungus. And for me, like ladies, oh my God, if you go to get your toes done, you have a high risk of catching things because they don't necessarily, you know, you have to actually autoclave to get the spores of different fungal overgrowth to, to kill them. And then they're on the everywhere, you know, including the implements. And you have to kind of bring your own implement or make sure they're like super like autoclaving the material. I, when I played soccer and baseball, I used to get uh, on my feet, I used to get in between my big toes, I'll get this crust. It was so gross and it would itch so bad. And I would just not. Yeah, I yeah. Not. Itch oh, it. I forgot. So watering eyes. Oh. So like a lot of pets have watering eyes. They get fungal overgrowth. Yeah. You know, when they go through the shelter or some vet or what, you know, they're getting vaccinated. They're getting tons of antibiotics for, and, and they're getting tons of antiparasitics for heartworm and other worms, you know. So where's so, the fungus actually living and what is it feeding on when it's like in your nasal cavity, right? I, I think it can live anywhere moist. So we have tear ducts, the whole mucosa of the eyeball. Like sometimes people are notice it's super red. And then as they get better, and their liver clears, you know, the, the whites come out and then the redness like will dissipate. And then for people with allergic shiners, that instantly will start to go away. I, I feel the allergic shiners are really great reflection of the small intestinal area, but not everyone has this, you know, like supermodels with great genes don't have that, but they could be super, you know, messed up in the gut. They just, I mean, you know, they just are going to have an expression elsewhere. Yeah. 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 It's just the expression. We're all genetically a little different. Our, our burdens are different. Our, our, Parasitic burdens are a little different, so they just express a little differently. So when when it's kind of systemic like that, right? So it's like I had I had this feeling when I was healing from this, uh, you know, from this injury that it was like, I don't know, it almost felt like there was like fungal overgrowth in the scar tissue in my hip. Have you? What do you think goes on when you get an injury like that and something gets locked up, right? You got a hip, you get a hipper, and uh, you get a big old knot in there, and it's just like. I mean, it's just gunk. It's just fascia tissue, collagen, and it's all gunked up. And now we know that collagen can actually collect glyphosate. Uh, we know that uh, animals that eat a lot of glyphosate you know, can collect in the collagen. Right. So there's one thing that could be going on, right? So when I do mm-hmm. get deep mm-hmm. into those tissues, sometimes I'll get mm-hmm. symptoms recur, right? So it's like if I uh, if I go okay. for a run, right, and I really mm-hmm. twist up my back, yeah. it'll throw the gut biome off for like two or three days while the back comes back in alignment. And sometimes I can't even tell which one started it. And it almost feels to me like my body is, it's like it opens up fascia tissue. And it almost feels to me like my body's like, oh, there's a bunch of like whatever that was in there. But we got to mm-hmm. pull this out now. And mm-hmm. it's going to be a load on your liver. And you're going to get a couple days where you might be stiff. Is that um, right? Okay. I, I mean, that's just my own subjective weirdo like way of explaining what I'm experiencing sometimes. I, I, I think people get crystallization of different things. One thing we know that comes out of fungal overgrowths, all of them is something called oxalates. And oxalates are minerals, they crystallize. Um, they're found in lumpy breasts, so like fibrocystic breasts, they're found all over different tissues, uh, bone, bone marrow, osteoporosis, osteopenia. We, we um, identify it because we look at, at urine data, like what we love to use is called the Great Plains Urine, um, urine Organic Acid Test, the OAT. Um, it's about $2.99, um, and we do this sequentially with all our clients, and we have some group classes where we include the kit in, in everything because it, it's so important to identify it. And people who have some ge- certain genetic mutations, it's known as AGXT or AG, um, AGT, they don't clear oxalates as well. Oxalates are just a normal part of pollution in our mitochondria, and so in our red blood cells, anything that moves around, anything that re- requires a lot of replenishment of energy and ATP, o- oxalates are going to just be a, n- a normal pollutant. And we have ways to quench it. But when we get oversaturated, um, then we develop kidney stones, heart plaque, coronary artery disease plaque, strokes, fascia stiffening. That's crazy. Collagen stiffening. Have you noticed some people are so wrinkly, they don't even smoke. Yeah. They have oxalates from fungal overgrowth in their gut. Usually these are like super oxidized people, like type one, two, type one diabetics, uh, anyone with a huge amount of like uh, inflammation, usually like the joint pain people. Yeah. polyarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. They may or may not have the wrinkles, but they've got achiness, like fibromyalgia, yeah. like huge oxalate. These are huge oxalates. Sure. Now Which I know when my gut goes off, it's like I'll feel aches in my body. And it's like, well, and, and sometimes one will happen before the other. Sometimes mm-hmm. it'll just be like, 
uh, I had a stressful week and I had stand up too much or, you know, was, had bad posture. And, but I'll, you know, I'll feel yeah. these little, these yeah. little things will, will crystallize together. It's a really interesting, it's a really yeah. interesting thing. And it's always, and they, so, they grow it overnight. So then you wake up, you're stiff again. Yeah. yeah. They're recolonizing, you know, the oxalates are, are getting saturated and everything and then recrystallizing out. And so our clients tell us like usually in the first two to four weeks, they, they feel a lot less achy by two to three months. They don't feel pain at all. That's always wonderful to hear because some of them have had pain and achiness for not just months, but usually years and decades. Like they didn't even know like you could be pain for you. Like, cause as a teen or in their twenties, they had headaches or aches or migraines, you know, all the time. And, and then even, how is that going to affect their, like their, their cognition, you know, I mean, their, their neurotransmitters. Exactly. Yeah. It's not normal. And we can clear that up because it's, it's a balance, you know, when we introduce the good stuff. So a couple of our strains actually eat and degrade oxalates. That's cool. Which strains yeah. in particular actually do that? B lactis is one. Um, B longum is another. And I forgot some of the other names. Uh, there's like two or three of the lactobacilli that do it. How many strains are in the, the one you sent me? Like your book, you and Jessica have an amazing book on ferments. Lactobacillus plantarum is the, the main lactobacilli in the ferments. It's a mm -hmm. huge oxalate degrader. We've, we've actually, correct, we've got a, in, in part of the book has oh, a section. Okay, okay. Oh, I got the draft. Got okay, I got the, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. No, the, a whole book on ferments, that's a daunting task. Well, okay. okay. Sandor well, Katz did a good one. Yeah, he did. Oh, I love Sandor. Yeah. <laughs> you had him on your, yeah, you had him I on did. your podcast. I heard him. It yeah. was a good episode. Yeah, he's fine. All right. So, so there are many ways that we can get the good flora. They actually did this amazing study in Africa. So, you know, traditional Africans tend to eat more of their ancestral diet, but then the African, uh, like Caucasian Africans, they tend to eat more Western, right? Urban food. So they looked at, um, the kidney stone formers in both populations. And it was so funny. Um, the, the, the strains that we have in our probiotic and, um, we, and we know of other strains that break down oxalates, they're very high in, um, African Americans who actually had no stones, even though they had high oxalates in their serum blood. And then the Caucasians who had a high stone forming, um, they didn't have these strains. It's so interesting to, to mm. like actually, you know, connect the name of the strains and their abilities because they're all superheroes in our gut. We're starting to learn more about what they do. They not only keep us happy with GABA, serotonin and dopamine and balance our neurotransmitters in our, you know, chemical soup. They break down oxalates that make us creaky, old, achy, you know. Have you heard of achy breasts? Like that's just oxalates. Ooh. Breast I, cancer. I my wife talking about she gets achy breasts because she got a baby gnawing. Oh, she got a baby. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah if, you, if you have teeth on your nipples, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah, she got titty teeth marks all over. <laughs> she got one of the. Look at Ariana just passed out. All this talk about poo has put her to sleep. Well, you, you know, the rebounder is one of the best therapies for people who can't move around a lot or they have a lot of chronic fatigue. Dude, it's incredible. You know what? Because it opens got the lymph, right? And it opens the mm -hmm. lymph highway so the oxalates can stream out. And it's a non-impactful way that you can, like if you have, if you're hurt, if you've got joints that are aching, it's a way that you can move so much in such a short amount of time. Totally. Uh, it, it, it's really unrivaled. You I just feel like a kid again. Yeah. Just don't do a circle unless you're really good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Land on your I, I really like this thing. I, we awesome. On this one because I didn't want it to be creaky, so we got the one with the like, you know. Oh, the, nice. Then the, the, the top quality jump sport, and I'm happy with it. But it's uh, yeah. You got a high ceiling though. That's cool. Yeah, that's that's pretty high up there. I was gonna say like I'm, I feel like I might hit my head soon up there if I keep pushing. Because <laughs> I like you can jump high on this little thing. You can get real high. So um, all right. So actually providing your body with an environment that is more beneficial to your health can be done through the injection of good strains in there, right? So we're not just looking at like a straight up, a, you know, I got parasites, I got candida, like, you know, every, because everybody's had some, Everyone has some. Yeah. everybody's had like a freaking toe fungus, everyone, everybody's had something like a, a yeast infection or a little bit of thrush on the tongue. People have had these things. How do we, yeah, I don't want people to just start freaking out here and like, ah, I'm going to start Google doctoring and get on Cure Zone and start freak, you know, go through all that nonsense. Um, what else can we do other than, you know, seeding it with beneficial uh, gut bacteria, such as you offer in the Bifido Maximus, Maximus product? What about like, um, what about fiber? Uh, you, you mentioned you have a product called the Bionic Fiber, fiber. and somebody yeah, it's has a actually... mix, a generic mix of stuff, yeah. 
Somebody actually asked about the uh, the protocol for using fiber and how you recommend they use your bionic fiber. Um, yes, John says ask you about the updates on your bionic fiber protocol. Awesome. Um, for mostly healthy people, I think it's great. Um, I personally do like 20 grams a day, and then if I'm really lucky, you know, 25 grams maybe twice a day, and I feel like super great when I'm doing that, and you know, great brain health, great you know ability to burn body fat when I want to. Um, when I'm sitting all day, <laughs> but um, for people with really severe overgrowths, and you wouldn't really necessarily know this unless you, you know, do a little bit of testing. You know, don't don't guess so much, but do the testing and just see the levels of overgrowth. I actually don't really recommend a lot of the prebiotics like bionic fiber too early um, during a gut rehab. Some people will do great, and it'll actually shift a lot of things in a really good way. Many, you know, because we have such epic levels of gut uh, damage now. Um, Many can run into a problem and they can actually feed some of the overgrowths. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just like some people love low carb and there's usually a reason. They're, the body's wisdom is that, you know, they know their microbiome flips out when they eat too much starches because it's feeding not the good stuff. Our, our good bacteria, like all the strains in the Bifa Maximus, they can help us break down sugars, disaccharides, trisaccharides, monosaccharides. So they're, they're actually supposed to help us to break down glucose and fructose and make them into even better alchemy and magic. Um, but when people don't have these strains, even if they're eating an amazing diet, they've been paleo for like umpteen million years, you know, and blah, 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 and doing bionic fiber or probiotics even, blah, 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 right? They still have fatty liver. You know, we look at a liver test and it, for men, it should be 15 and below, women 12 and below, and they, they still have fatty liver. It's like 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And that's insane. That's because of the terrain. The terrain affects everything. The terrain's everything. But we can shift it. So we, we have some like beginner classes, you know, people can learn about this and how there's some customized protocols because you, you know, you do the gut test and then um, there's customized protocols through the That's class. That's the gut, the gut institute .com. Yeah. Yeah. If you just, you know, we have some classes available um, and they're great. And then we're building a new class. It'll have everything, all the supplements for um, aches, headaches, acne and anxiety. Um, mo most of the, you know, worst of the worst, the, you know, and very common like gut dysbiosis issues. So like some of the things you kind of mentioned as you're growing up. You know, asthma, acne, feeling this drive, this akathisia. People you know? might be like thinking they're just full of shit because they're naming everything. It's like, oh, you stub your toe, or it's all just the gut. But I mean, really, oh, the no. gut is so much throughout the body. Yeah, it's it's yeah, really yeah. it's ubiquitous. Right. You know, it's like when I don't, it, it really just amazes me how int intimately connected every single system in our body is to mm -hmm. our gut and our brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our brains are so strong, right? Like, like gamma meditation, we can affect even each gamma waves and deep, deep meditation, which I'm not a really great practitioner, but I know they affect other people. Yeah. No, I mean, we can affect like, and mind body. reading. Yeah. And oxytocin. Um, like, yeah, we, I mean, even though you're millions of miles away in Ecuador and I'm here in California, like we even affect each other in, in this macro way. It's pretty fascinating. Absolutely. I mean, even, even like we don't have to get too subtle with it. It's like, yeah. I could be a real big jerk and make you have a bad day. Then that could affect your, you know what I'm saying? It's like, or oh, yeah, we yeah. could, we could come together. We could have this like communion and it's like, we're both, yeah. we walk away, we're stoked, we're positive. We're, and then the rest of our day, it's just building on that energy. That's going to affect our gut microbiome as well. So it's like, it, to me, this all this stuff, it, it, it's so fascinating, especially, and I, I like to comment somebody made earlier. And I started well, sound. About, you talked about energy, but sound, right? Uh, like your voice and my voice and Jessica's voice. Like there's, an, there's a communication, right? And it probably even affects our microbiome in some ways that we don't fully understand yet, right? Absolutely. Like, if I had an angry you sound, your, your microbiome may pick up on it, or you will, you know, mm. right? right? It, it's something. Yeah, and there's mm. a lot of things we don't fully, fully understand. But That's just my there. prediction. I said this in a recent uh, podcast. All right, so we've got photo biomodulation, huge right now. Uh, but we've also, there's this big move in the late 2000s, people talking about cymatics and the nature of reality and stuff like that, how vibration and sound affects things. And when you look at all, you know, ohm being the primordial, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in the beginning there was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You know, it's like the, there seems to be something that is the essence of mm, this experience that is profound. And all the spiritual traditions talk about the basic of yeah. the basis of reality being vibration and sound. So I think we're going to be looking at a lot of more like, I don't even know what you call it. We got photo biomodulation, then we'll get, I don't know, audio biomodulation, where it's like people are going to be using sound therapeutically. And I think science I, is going to I look do. I have all my clients do binaural beats to get mm -hmm. in the gamma wave pattern because if it heals their brain, get, guess where this other brain is, right? right. 
Well, it's how about how about gut. specific targeted devices that'll throw specific frequencies that will generate or attack certain things? In your, I mean, we're talking about Raymond Rife here, basically. Right? I know Rife. I love Rife, but you got to be it's, careful. It's Rife can I didn't come even up, think of that. Like too many things. That's already been done. <laughs> it's all already. Yeah, I know. Rife is pretty badass. Yeah, right. Anybody want to look into some some amazing 20th century history? Raymond Rife and his incredible microscopes that he made. That um, there's a few of them around still. Um, Oh yeah. All right, so here's here's somebody. Okay. Andrew, my buddy Andrew Scarborough. Okay. Uh, was Maybe one more question, and then I gotta go. But right yeah, on. We, yeah, yeah. Let's, and let's make another date. I love this. And oh, we'll Jessica, do it. Yeah, we'll do it yeah, again. Jessica can tell me talking. more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's cool talking because you can just you can flow well. It doesn't have to be like, oh, here's the talking points. We talk about my book and this. And this. It's fun. All right, so check it out. Uh, Andrew Scarborough. He's uh, I've had him on the show several times. He's a buddy of mine. He's a really nice guy. He's got a uh, he had a brain tumor, an astrocytoma. Okay. And he used a very low carb ketogenic diet to actually heal from this experience after his surgery and stuff and to manage epilepsy. Uh -huh. He's found that he's less sensitive now to certain foods and he's able to increase awesome. the microbial uh, diversity. He's been playing with things like sauerkraut and stuff and he's not awesome. getting any negative effects on seizure threshold. And he seems that he thinks it's beneficial. Now, Andrew loves to peck through things. He's non dogmatic, he's always exploring everything, and he's a PhD student looking to you know help educate people he's been asking he's asking about entomophagy and the gut microbiome do we need more research or is the research simply ignored and i don't even know what entomophagy is is that autophagy um, it says he says entomophagy i'm not sure what ento i don't know what ento is and en ento like like insects ento entomophagy and en the gut microbiome e n t o you're talking about Entomophagy, like the death of microbes and when they die, what that does to the... I mean, for probiotics, dead is better than nothing. Dead, dead is as good as uh, live, actually, in even some studies. But not, you know, other studies show it's not quite as good, you know, as the live bacteria. Um, okay. Yeah, but... All right, so let's... One more question from Andrew. Sure. So yeah, he's been very interesting. VSL, VSL number three, he wanted to experiment with It's very that. high in strep. Crazy okay, so that. for somebody who perhaps has... Okay, he's, he just answered. He said consuming insects. Yeah, in oh, okay, okay, bio. yeah, yeah. He likes okay. insects because he okay. did so, zero So one of the down. products on our store that I love is called Chitin and Chitin oligosaccharides. And we have a couple actually weight loss products um, that have Chitin, but Chitin's a very, very special fiber for the gut microbiome. It's antifungal, antimicrobial, antiparasitic a little bit. It also binds crap. It's known as the herbal uh, well call or the herbal cholestyramine to remove estrogens and phthalates and chemicals out of the body and Fantastic. it's pretty amazing it can actually lower oxalates and lower um, glyphosate i mean uh, our protocols right. lower you know glyphosate and oxalates but this binder can in addition to having the flora you know that break down break those down and what about a uh, diatomaceous earth because that's a diatomaceous you have to be careful the source you know can have heavy metals mm. yeah um okay, so it's a same, same, yeah same with um like restore, mm, you know, I love it, but then I, I'm not sure where their source is. And, um, you know, you that, have to get their that source is great, but it has. That one fascinates me. I've metals. got a bottle, used it on and off, didn't feel the, anything yeah. really from it. Uh, right. But what I've heard with like autistic kids and stuff, you know, I mean, I, it, it just seems like it could be really beneficial. Um, have, you, have you seen any lab work of people who've used restore like long term? I haven't seen, I've seen some lab work, but most. See, I'm, 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 you know, if, if things like don't fix 80, 90% of problems, I'm kind of, eh, you know, cause I'm, I'm more going forward, you know, to be, um, you know, more high, higher, uh, efficacy. So, yes. you know, some, certain things like Antronil, like, I think it's great. And, you know, some people report huge improvements, but my, my, my clientele tend to not notice so many, you know, we have to do kind of a more comprehensive wide scale thing. Yeah. But right on. So to but finish yeah, off, what are some, yeah, what are some, Ecuador, and there's amazing grub and insects and this is part of like the ancestral diet. Yeah. We, and, or eating mollusks or making soup and, you know, where this, the shell of lobster, crabs, crustaceans, you know, are all melted down in the soup. It's amazing. That's how we get the oligosaccharides, oligochitin, which is yeah. just a superfood. Yeah. So um, there's a company we work with um, called Quicksilver by Chris Shade. So we use a ton of their products and ad advocate it and, you, you know, share our protocols for how we um, help the gut, you know, remodel a lot faster. And he just came out with a new ultra binder. And the main ingredient is, in, is chitin because it helps right. to find other things way better than the prior product that he had. And we help to produce, help him, you know, 
he, he uh, needed some data. We helped him with the tech sheet for that. That's but, so cool. Yeah, yeah so Andrew, chitin, but cotton is a seafood thing. So like some people have seafood allergies and may be allergic to it. Ah, but but also if you're eating crickets, you're getting lots of chitin, right? So Andrew's yeah, and, it's, and chitin's like a crickets and chitin are, are a great weight loss tool. It really yeah. is. I try to bake right. it into cookies. It's really crunchy and sandy. So my kids are like. <laughs> So I Andrew, couldn't even eat it. Yeah, I tried to stick I mean, it in meatloaf. Uh, no, no go. Everything just tasted like we were cooking on a, a beach, like sand was <laughs> everything. If they fine grind it, like there's fine ground almond flour, like that's probably a little better as long as it doesn't get yeah. heated, you know, and rancid. What do you think about almond flour? Uh, very high in oxalates, so it's I not know, good right? for some people. It tastes so good. It's so good. And in, it's like, so good. good. It tastes like Mrs. It's just Field's not cookies. the best You just food, can't man. stop. Yeah. Know, no, we love like, it. We, it we tastes make, really good, but it's just I, I try to keep it like once a week or something, you know. Once yeah, a week. yeah. Keep you gotta have week. diversity. I'd almond rather flour, you know, I feel better if I eat almond flour than if I eat wheat or something like that. But it's still it's like it's not the ideal food, you know. It's like you eat like there's certain foods that I eat and I know it's like, oh yeah, that's there's no burden. It's too that. almond flour is just too easy, right? Like if you had to have, huck and shell all those almonds and then grind them to the mm -hmm. pulp, the fine you know, powder that it is. Oh my God, after all that work, you wouldn't want to do anything. Like it right. take 20 hours to make one. Well, then you, plus the, all the, the omega-6 load, of course, not desirable, if, you know, out of yeah, balance. It's really problem. healthy. It's okay. But yeah, it's a lot of omega-6, a lot of For omega-6. Sure. I, I love how it tastes, but as far as like nutrition value, it's just like, hey, you're not so awesome. I don't know why people pretend you're like so special. <laughs> one of those things. <laughs> well, they so make Andrew, great you've been, going Andrew's, into the holiday season. Andrew Scarborough, I think it's really interesting. Like you, you loved the, um, you loved the insect part of the diet and it was so helpful for you and it wasn't just because like you know a lot of people they get into the, the low carb myopic mind state right where it's like well it's because it's a low carb diet well there's another confounding factor right there of like you are getting such great results using these insect things and it's not just that oh it's the amino acid profile is this or that it could have had to do with the chitin reducing inflammation systemically through the body and binding up crap that was in there and it um, just could be many more things going on I think you're on the right track Andrew, but um, Grace, I, I want to thank you for coming Thanks on. Thanks so much for having you. me on again, Tristan. Yeah. So fun. How I can my audience is going to love it too. Yeah. How can people find, all right, so the Bifido Maximus, I got to put my, my big fat stamp of approval on it because I've tried like VSL number three and some of these other supposedly really high-end probiotics. And I got to be honest, Grace's is better priced and get, de delivers much more bang for the buck and it's better formulated, more importantly. So if you guys want to check out the uh, the Bifido Maximus, I don't know, maybe I'll talk to Grace later on and we can come up with some way to do an affiliate thing or something. But anyway, yeah. she's got her website, The Gut Institute. She's got great stuff. Uh, she's got courses up and she's a wealth of information. Um, let's let's see, any, any closing thoughts here, Grace, on uh, where the people might be able to find more or uh, any takeaway thoughts from this convo? Maybe I'll come on again in a few weeks after we like get some more interesting topics on board. Like that would be really cool. I'm down. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. your I love your, you know, QS, you know, quantified self way of like looking at things. I mean, I, I did a lot of that myself to, you know, get help better and then for my clients in rounding out certain protocols. And that's because, you know, we just have to now, but it's great because everyone's really different. Not not one thing works for anybody. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So it's I love like how you you know, you I mean, you're, you're pretty scientific. You know what factors you're adjusting. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what we're it's about here. It's like we yeah, truly you're using the scientific method. Not, I mean, I think people mistake the scientific method for uh, you know religious uh, language. Now it's like you know you just say, oh, this is science, and it's suddenly it's like you're oh the the word of God, you know. But it's like no, science is a method of exploration of testing yeah. hypotheses, and it's not just like a oh that person says it and they got to a thing on their head that says science test. You know, it's, we, we gotta, we gotta go beyond that. We gotta look at the actual <laughs> studies and actually experiment on ourselves and realize that we are, we're only broaching the surface uh, with some of this stuff like the gut microbiome, helminths, right? Parasite. And we keep going back to ancient wisdom, like like Andrew eating insects. You know, um, yeah. That's we keep eating going. Gut, eating bugs for his gut bugs. Yeah. All right, guys, so keep it simple. Don't freak out if you think you got candida overgrowth or something like that. Hey, Sorry. make it easy. Don't just blast yourself and with antifungals. Don't go drinking bleach. One step at a yeah. time. Do it in a measured fashion and uh, you know test <laughs> test yourself, people. 
So thanks so much, Grace, yeah, for coming on. I'm going to end so the broadcast. Now you guys can find more at thegutinstitute.com, and you can awesome. also find more at primaledgehealth.com. See you guys next time.